Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Lords of Limited. My name is Ben Warney, and joining me on the line, as always, Mr. Ethan Lost the Plot Sachs. Ethan, I hear you are potentially down on plot from our show notes. You are, yeah, you're spoiling a little bit of the episode uh, coming up ahead. But yes, I am a little bit down on plot. I was hoping we were going to duke it out, but I think we're more in line perhaps than than not. But I think there are some things that I thought would be true about plot that are are in fact not. And now I just can't stop sounding like Dr. Seuss because everything rhymes with plot. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, sir? How was your pre-release weekend? I'm doing very well. My pre-release weekend was quite good. There's so much to talk about with this format. We, yeah. we have to get to the most important headlining thing, though. Okay. We're going to have to find a new take. Secret Reach is dead. I know. It's okay, gone. So, so for folks who, folks who don't know, the, the arena update now has a big glaring, like larger than the actual card, <laughs> pulsing highlighted bow pulsing and <laughs> bow and arrow to let you know. But it only happens like if it's if it's if I'm playing against Ben, Ben's cards will only light up when it's my turn. So I know not to attack with my flyers into his big, dumb reach creature. So, yeah. Secret Reach is no more. It's so off-putting. I was watching videos from the early access. Yeah, I was. I was not a fan. Yeah. Well, do we? What do we take about the trade-off? Like they get, they're giving us basically a golden egg every format. They told us, so we're okay there. But now Secret Reach is dead. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know. Yeah, the trade-off doesn't feel worth it for sure. All right, so we got a lot to talk about. Had early access this week, so we got a chance to play with the cards online um, after waiting in a 20-minute draft queue. Um, we also got to do some pre-releases. I did two. I think you did one. So we got a lot of reps under our belt before the set drops on Tuesday. A lot to talk about, a lot of cards to go over. Let's get into it. First things first is the Patreon page. Patreon.com slash Lords of Limited is where folks can go to give back to the show if they so choose. The show will always be free, but we have some great perks over at the Patreon. We always talk about the Discord being the place to be for 24-7 limited tech support. This is a great week to join. You're going to want to be in there when the new set drops on Tuesday. I told you, like, we have these, like, little fire emojis next to channels that are um, very active, like if there's been a, a message dropped in the last five or ten minutes. Discord is going to be on fire on Tuesday. There's going to be a lot of chatter happening, a lot of people going over their draft logs, their their builds, you know, pick order stuff. It's just a great time to be a uh, great time to be alive, honestly, but a great time to be uh, in the Lord's Limited Discord. I always, always also shout this out a little too late, but there's an arena open the first weekend in May, and those weekends are also great times to be in the Discord. You get to get some feedback on on sealed pools, get people to tell you to, to cut your losses and stop entering on day one, maybe encourage you to fire one more more bullet on day one if that's what you need um a little pick me up for so yeah any any all that is available via the discord and we have other great perks as you move up the reward tier rankings as well we want to shout out our new patrons the first week that they join so this week we are welcoming demos where did john go mike jonathan premishlaw joshua nathan colin david bryce commander cardinal jonathan and mark thank you thank you thank you we really appreciate your support yeah cannot say thank you enough Pre-release. Yes, sir. Very good, right? I mean, how, how did it go for you? Well, I mean, my my record was immaculate. I played, I played, uh, I went to a, an LGS last night. I went 3-0 there. And I did a sort of like home pre-release with three friends on Friday. We just got a box and just like hung out. My friend, uh, his wife is out of town. So he, he was on daddy duty. So he was like, hey, after bedtime, if people want to come over. So we just did that and did a like, played three people, went 3-0 there. So that was good. I would say like in terms of comparing the two pre-releases, I will take home pre-release with no prize support and people playing at a reasonable pace versus <laughs> versus Saturday night pre-release and people going to turns. Like I get it. The set's new. I get it. People have different skill levels. It's just it's just not for me. It's not my scene. I don't care about the prize packs enough to want to do that. Wow, you heard it here, folks. Ethan Sachs hates pre-releases. You're going to get I, aggregated, and, baby. I'll tell you what else. I think we just need to kill Sealed as a limited format. Like, Yes, please. I think, I think we should have killed it probably a while ago, but I really do think play boosters are like nail in the coffin. It's just too... the It's just too juiced. Either we can keep it, but like give everyone like nine packs and just say like, this is basically constructed and that's fine. Or like, let's just draft. 
I, I just I, I can't do sealed just feels like a relic such a, a an old relic of the past to me at this point that we just do it because like we've always done it and that's usually the worst reason to do anything yeah I mean you're not gonna hear any complaints from me I opened up my six packs and they were hot steaming garbage <laughs> I was playing against rares left and right at the pre-release but I mean the disparity has always been there you're always rolling the dice a bit in sealed but it does feel amplified with play boosters I would agree it felt a little bit, and I think this set, I guess, is going to be slightly more because of the the big score cards. I don't think that's going to be a slot moving forward, right? That's just sort of a thing that they did because of, like, Aftermath didn't sell well, so they're jamming these and these boosters, whatever. I don't know if that's, I assume that's not going to be a staple moving forward, but, like, it's just a slight juice a bit more, you know, into those packs with those. A methods. little bit, a little bit extra. A little bit extra. <laughs> okay, quick story time. Speaking yes. of juice. So after school on Friday, the teachers went to this Mexican restaurant and several of them brought their kids and almost everyone had big margaritas. And one of the kids walked up to the table and said to our principal, that's a lot of juice. <laughs> You're not wrong. Yeah, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. There's a lot of juice. <laughs> what about okay? So I'm done. I I'm mostly complaining about my pre-release. Have it despite going six and zero. Oh. How, how about you? What, what what's your takeaway? I love that the pre-releases come out before release. That's my take on pre-releases. Yeah, uh, before the digital release. I think that is a great move. I went to the pre-release with my friend from high school and my older brother. Saw some other local friends that like. If the set came out digitally before the pre-release, I just I wouldn't have a reason to attend. And I and I like having a reason to attend pre-releases because I like spending time with those folks. Um, so I think that is my that is my news about pre-releases is that it was awesome that they made that decision and I'm glad they are continuing it. I also think it's just like good for us as slash our listeners that like we all have the same experience. That like we all get to go to the thing and then after our listeners get to like go to the thing this weekend, they get to listen to how was our time with it. Like we're all having we all have about the same sample size going into week one. It's not like we're just jamming a bunch of drafts already. So I think that that's good as well. Yeah, but speaking of my record pre-release, not so hot. Uh, my pool is not so good. I started out 0-0-2, speaking of, <laughs> speaking of uh, going the to draws time. And, slow, and slow play. 0-0-2, uh, and, and then finished 1-1 after that. So a stellar 1-1-2 and two here from uh, nice from me in the pre-release. So what's that? That gets you one one pack? Oh, no, baby. We we were abusing the draw bug. You get you, each each player gets a pack when you draw at our store, apparently. What is going on? I got to move to Indiana. I got to drive out. Drive so out to I, Indiana I took, I took home three packs. It's unbelievable. I went three and oh, and I took seven packs. Like, how is that? Doesn't seem that disparity seems too great. All right, let's get into impressions of the format and mechanics. For me, the big takeaway, the biggest mover up, start with the positive, is committing crimes. That is currently the thing. I am most excited about the payoffs, I think, seem great and the ways to trigger them seem plentiful if you're prioritizing them. And I think it's the most interesting piece of the formats puzzle with like the greatest yield for upping your win percentage in the draft deck building gameplay, all that stuff. I think the, the crime lands have just crazy impressed. Well, I have I have several things I, I would like to rebut. I think I still think plot is the headliner mechanic over committing crimes, We're but I do talk agree about plot. Can we focus I do, on the crimes for a second? We can. There are also two types of people when it comes to this world. Like I was watching a lot of videos uh -huh. of, of gameplay of the format when it comes to sequencing crime lands, much like people who have. 9,000 unread emails and people Oof. who have people who zero. have zero unread emails. There are people in their opener that have crime land, 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 and who responsibly play that crime land tapped on turn one. And then there are people who are trying to squeeze that value for the potential crime trigger late in the game with that I, crime land. Am I in trouble? Am I being I, called listen, out? I, I, listen, I just watched some of your videos and you are you are on the camp of holding those crime lands. I had a deck with four ravens, four of the crime ravens. What do you want from me? I'm just listen. I'm not saying it was wrong. I'm just saying there's there's tendencies there, and I think well, sequencing. I, I agree. Sequencing them is going to be a fun puzzle. I, yeah, I have that as a bullet point. I just think that sequencing crime lands depending on the payoffs. I'm not saying mm -hmm. like hold them in your hand to the detriment of curving out, or even if you don't have any, uh, especially if you don't have any payoffs currently in your hand. But like, I just think it's 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 part of the puzzle. But the crime lands just them them having them being tutorable by basically all of the green things that find lands. That's a big game makes splashing at least certainly in sealed i felt like splashing was, was i don't know it's it's touch and go i guess because like my 
my first pool on Saturday or on Friday, I only opened two deserts. And then on Saturday, I opened five deserts in my pool. Um, and that surveil land is awesome too. The surveil um, filtered desert, I like a lot, um, in sealed at least. But yeah, I think I just think committing crimes has been fun. So that's, I guess, mostly concentrated in black, red and, and black, blue. But I think, you know, it just depends on on the sort of concentration of cards you have. Yes, I think I do agree. Committing crimes has been easy when you want to do it. Like it just happens naturally. And then if you're trying to do it, you can do it almost every turn, sometimes on your turn and the opponent's turn. You know, maybe you play a crime land on your turn. You got an instant speed spell to hold up on their turn. It's been very doable. It turns you all your like it turns your removal into not two for ones. Like if it's not if it's inherently a one for one removal spell, then your removal spell is giving you giving you a little bit of extra stuff. And that really helps push the removal over the top. As we were talking about last week, like is removal going to be good or bad? We'll, we'll talk about our, our early impressions in just a little bit. All right. So I am down on plot from where I was initially. I think with the caveat of I still think this is a powerful mechanic. For me, the biggest thing I've noticed is there is a huge difference between things that can plot for two or three mana versus four or five mana. Like, and I think maybe the biggest the biggest mover down for me is Lone Shark, the three and a blue, three, four, with plot for three and a blue. And when it enters the battlefield, if uh, it's the second thing you've cast this turn, or yeah, when it enters the battlefield, and if it's the second thing you've cast this turn, uh, you draw a card. I just don't, like, sure, that's fine, I guess, if you've already plotted something on three and get to double spell with it, but that just more makes plot on three good and Lone Shark not as good. So uh, the expensive plot cards... I'm off on. You just can't, you really can't afford, I think, to invest four mana to not impact the board. And it doesn't, even if you've, you know, plotted a turn prior and get to cast something, you're just, you don't want to be paying four mana to put something into exile. I mean, I haven't played enough to know yet. I'm still curious to try out Lone Shark, but I hear you that ideally you're plotting on three and casting Lone Shark on four. The play pattern of plotting Lone Shark on four and casting something else on five to get the trigger that way is significantly worse. It's significantly worse. And and like and the thing about Lone Shark in that respect is like then it just becomes replaceable, I think, because pl- plotting on three and then double spelling with any four drop on four is probably going to be good. And it doesn't have to be Lone Shark drawing you a card, too. Sure. I, yeah. I, yeah. I would buy into that completely. That Lone Shark is not a truly desirable card in that sense. So, and then again, this is very small sample size. So my um, sealed on Friday was blue, green, splashing, white. And I was splashing, part of my white splash was for both of the blue, white signpost uncommon. So the three, three flying vigilance that draws you a card. If at your end step, you haven't cast something from your hand and the flash five mana, one, four, that makes a two, two flyer on your end step. If you haven't cast something from your hand one, my initial take is that the thing that makes spirits is much better than the thing that draws cards. Which one and draws cards? A three three flying vigilance. A three three flying vigilance. Yeah, that one's that my, my take is still that one is I, I steaming think, hot garbage. I think you're very right because like you're often just like taking some damage. You're you're you know you're gonna have to trade that thing off eventually. And so you're like, well, can I get a card first before I trade it off with their whatever random three two? So I, I agree. I'm steaming garbage is a bit aggressive, but I'm here for the language is evocative for sure. But I, my my major thing for both of those cards is that for this for the blue white not casting stuff from your hands, I think you would just rather pass and flash in something. Rather, it just feels so tempo negative. Like if you go end step, flash in your the one four, then pass my turn, make my two two flyer, and then I get to do something else on your turn, like flash in mystical tether, the three mana. Oblivion Ring that can you can pay two more to give it flash, whatever. Something like that. So then you're affecting the board that turn cycle. That feels fine. And then you're getting your bonus 2-2. Two, two. What doesn't feel fine is flash in my 1-4, plot, and then you're just like, fingers crossed. Here's my, I can make a 2-2. Two, two. I'm not doing anything on your turn. Then I unta- It's just, I, I think, for my money, I think you'd rather play a draw go game with those payoffs than you would play a plot game with those payoffs. Yeah, I agree. I think largely there's there's a lot to explore in the draw go control territory here and outside of blue white as well. I think blue black can play draw go control mm-hmm. pretty well also. But I think plot as a thing I'm higher on. I, I agree the four and five mana plot not so excited about, but there's so many cards with plot two and three that are just amazing. Yes. And the fact that you can also kind of mess up your opponent's plan like yes they get to see your plot thing but if they're holding up mana on a turn 
you know, potentially for a removal spell. You can also plot things to hide stuff from removal. Mm -hmm. I just think the the power turns that you can set up via planning and hiding your creatures with plot and then putting multiple out at once. The tempo swings you can create seem amazing to me. And just getting to set up every time I've seen Plotcaster Mage, I don't know what the actual name of that card is. <laughs> Shot lock picker. Yeah. Um, the two in a blue two three. Anytime that gets plotted, it's just an absolute beating. Yes. The following turn when it gets unplotted, because you do that, you cast a spell. Maybe you're doing something else, too. You've played some cheap removal spell. That card seems absolutely incredible to me. But just how you can construct the tempo of the game with plot and the flexibility it provides, just I'm really excited to play with it when the set drops online. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and so perhaps like I'm just saying I'm lower on it than I was. And that's mostly, again, about Lone Shark, I guess. But and and, and he, also the I forget the name of it, but the the five mana five, four in green that has trample and ETBs and you gain three life and has plot for three in a green, like just all, all that stuff that's like that, that we thought was good that had plot for four or more mana, I think is less good with with one exception that we'll talk about when we get to individual cards. What's going on in, in the gameplay department for you? What's your your take on this set? Well, I, I haven't played a ton because I didn't play in the early access, but I have watched probably about as much as I would have played. Like I've watched, I don't know, five, six, seven hours of, of videos. I've watched some of your stuff, some of LSV stuff, some of Reed stuff, some of Numat stuff. So I've gotten a, a sampling from a variety of different players. The format feels more normal speed to me, like a scotch slower than we've seen lately from formats I like still modern limited in that you have to be doing stuff but not that you get quite so horrifically punished and there's much more catch-up type mechanics there's a lot more incidental life gain attached as etbs to things if you're into that there's some lifelink floating around um, but just from what i've seen you know the last couple formats curving out and smashing has been very mm -hmm. powerful and i i don't think it is here i don't think that is plan a for the best decks in this format that's interesting. Yeah, I, I think I'll co-sign that. I will say, I think stumbling on lands punishes you really hard. Not necessarily stumbling on board presence, right? Plot sort of messes with that a little bit. You can afford to maybe not affect the board initially for value later on. But I, I have just found like there is, because plot kind of snowballs in a sense, I think stumbling on lands has just felt punishing. But that's, I think that's just not unique also. That just always is going to feel punishing probably. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because the plot is a way to be mana efficient. And then if you're right, like, if you're missing lands, you're just not being mana efficient, period. And if you're not being mana efficient in modern limited, I think you're not you're doing just, very well. You're just done. Yeah, I've been crazy impressed with good ETBs. There's been a lot of creatures with good ETBs common through rare. I mean, certainly the format seems uncommon driven to me, but I think that's probably just going to be true. Of that's just play, play boosters, boosters now. Yeah. Right. So there, there are tons of good uncommons with ETBs, but there are also some commons and then there's some absurd rares also. But along with that, there's tons of blinks and bounces and reanimates and just mm. ways to like repeatedly abuse those ETB triggers. For it to me so far from what I've seen, it seemed like get some great cards and then get a bunch of cards that complement those great cards really well and try to do them over and over and over and over. I'm worried that this is going to be again with the the sort of the big score and the um, OTP reprint slot that like there is that we're, we're just in a re repeat of the artifact remix of like, just take the card in the upper left corner. There are so many busted rares and mythics in this set. This I'm is not Ethan Sachs, ladies and gentlemen, he hasn't been kidnapped. This <laughs> isn't his Twitter cry for help. I'm not complaining yet. I'm just <laughs> saying I'm, I'm worried that, it will just feel a little, I don't know, like, okay, what what bomb am I starting with? And then I'm going to draft towards that the best I can. I don't think it's going to be that. I, I okay. have really high hopes for this format. I, I, I do think there are a lot of great rares, but I also think there's a lot of pushed commons and uncommons. I certainly think there's a wide variety of strategies. A mm -hmm. Prize of the Varmints seems like a real deal. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but there's there's kind of three pillars of decks as I see them right now. I mean, outside of bomb rares, there's there's the decks that get to be aggressive synergistically, like red, black plot um, or things like that. Mm -hmm. There's the control decks that get to play all the really efficient, you know, sometimes gives you bonuses along with it, removal spells that are in the format, plus from the, the OTP bonus sheet that kind of mm -hmm. juices up the removal in the format a little bit. Right. And they, they get to play control that way. And then there's the decks that, well, there's also the blue, red, that blue red deck is kind of its own thing. I would put that maybe in the synergistic tempo aggro deck along with red black. 
And then there's the the grindy decks, right? That get to recur things. Great green, black, black green it's creatures over and I over mean, and over again. You're you're leading us great into the power rankings, which is like you'll notice that Ben said red, black, and blue, black, and green, black. Like you have black in number one here, but you have it equal to blue in, in the power rankings. I would put black and then like two greater than signs before the next color in whatever ranking you have. I think black is pushed in this format. I mean, black's really good. And to be clear, these are like normally I feel whatever. 80 percent. No one told you to put these down. No one one. told you to put them in the notes. Listen, it's a staple of the show. (laughs) And I this is my this is the part of the format I enjoy the most. But I'm I'm less confident about these. So I could believe there's more greater than science. But this is after watching and playing the pre-release. This is where I'm at. I do think blue offers a lot at common and uncommon for things that you're interested in as far as controlling decks. And I, I do think those types of decks have legs in the format. So, yeah, I wanted to ask you about blue because so I feel I so Ben, let's let's just throw this out there. So Ben has black one, blue two, red three, green four, white five. I feel great about black being a number one. I feel great about white being number five. I've not been thrilled about white. I don't I think white's kind of shallow right now. I'm not saying it's unplayable or whatever, anything, but feels the weakest of the five to me. I would put red second personally over blue. So I wanted to, and I I think part of that is I've already said I'm down on Lone Shark. I will talk about when we get to it. I'm down on Phantom Interference, the counter spell with Spree at common. So two of my top commons from last week, I'm down on, which is making me feel a little tentative about what blue has to offer. So can you talk a bit about like what you're, what makes you excited about blue? Yeah, this is the uncommons. I think red has better commons yes. than blue does. Like right. red's the, deeper the, at common. The Wolverine but... and the prickly pear are great. Yeah, there's explosive derailment as a right. fine removal spell. There's the one drop haster. That's really important to red yeah. decks that want to get the game done with early. But blue's uncommons seem amazing to me for mm-hmm. control decks. And I think it seems like an uncommon driven format. And red's uncommons are largely unexpected. Yeah, they're clunkier for sure. Okay. I, I and that. it's tough. Like you could make a case for green too, because green's got great uncommons and absolutely bonkers rares too. Well, and a lot of greens, like as I'm thinking of them, a lot of greens signposts, like gold uncommons, are phenomenal too. Um, yes, but, but but again, also I think lacks pretty heavily in my mind in the common department. But that might be like this might be some growing pains for me in terms of how I'm like I always sort of gave way more weight to commons than uncommons, just for limited rankings because that's the stuff you're going to see more often but i'm not sure that that's true in a play booster world so we're we're still i still think i'm trying to calibrate for play boosters um with these initial impressions well and so much of it is what makes the best decks tick right Mm -hmm. it's do the gold on commons line up with commons from either color that make the deck tick into a functional archetype to me and i think i think blue really gets the goods at uncommon and and the commons while not being quite as individually impressive as reds are good role players in those blue control decks and you're you you have five best decks here that are all either blue or black which checks out with your your top two colors there as well yeah so blue white blue black red black green black and blue red are the ones i've been pretty impressed by i've been really unimpressed as far as decks to avoid by anything that's just playing creatures trying to curve out without other synergies going on like just like just like beat, s- beat down cab- aggro cabs ain't it Cabs ain't it in this format, I don't think. No, to borrow from LR. So wh- why is that? Like you're just saying like, so n- a deck that's like 16, 17 creatures, handful of removal spells, couple tricks. That's not it. I think you got to do more than that to get the game over with quicker. And that deck can fizzle out. And I yeah. think your aggro deck also needs some ways to, if the game stalls out a bit, to to find ways to get reach because the late game of some of the decks or some of the rares just stabilize so well. Mm. And just the life gain floating around. There's a lot of tools, I think, to combat aggro here, in addition to the efficient removal. Yeah, I buy that. I want to talk about some more specific things in the format. I was kind of impressed by mounts. Again, a difference for me with plot, and maybe this is just the way to evaluate cards, is like the two and three mana mounts are obviously way better than like the four plus mounts, especially because like some of those have like mount, you know, whatever. What's it? uh, Oh, especially because some of those have like saddle for three or whatever, which is that's a lot like crew three is 
huge. Like the difference between crew one and crew two is big. And the difference between two and three is very big. And a lot of those, again, they're just like the the creatures that are good that happen to have a saddle bonus. Like those are just the ones to keep an eye out on. But, you know, the the burrow fiend, the two mana, two, two and green that like mills two and then gets plus X plus X like that card's incredible. That card's amazing. I think I've liked the red three mana, four, two saddle one that has the like red card advantage ability of like exile the top card and then can play it and before the end of your next turn. Just the ones that are are like good on rate that are cheap, I think have been pretty impressive. It's just played out better. I needed to see it in play to be like, oh, okay, that works. I've seen a lot of good rare mounts mm. as well. There's a lot of yeah. cards that have saddle at rare that are very snowball-y. Yes. I, I still am worried about like Mounts are just mostly cards without great ETBs. That's and true. They just, they just get owned so hard. <laughs> the good removal in the format. There's so much efficient removal. Yes. Yeah. Which just makes like it be it, the more you can be two for one, the format, the, the worse you make your opponent's removal. I already talked about for sealed, like fixing felt scarce, maybe isn't the right word, but just like varied, like the, the depends on the deserts that you open. And I also think because of that, like, I would pay attention in this format to deserts dictating a bit. Like we've seen this before when dual lands exist at lower rarity. Like, sure, check your rares first. And then I would immediately check my fixing to be like, oh, I have two black red lands and a red green land. I am. Let's see if I can make Jund work because like that's going to let me play three crime lands, which is great. And I'm going to have good mana there. I think be wary of like playing green for fixing in that respect, because green can offer you a lot of fixing. But then are you playing any Does green offer you anything else? And if not, then you probably don't want like if you can afford to not play green. So I just be wary of that and let and let lands dictate perhaps a bit of of the direction that your sealed pool is going to go. Yeah, my seal pool, again, I only had the one, but it had fine fixing. But I think I got lucky. I opened three on color crime lands mm-hmm. and had one of the ones that's the evolving wilds variant where you choose the color oh, yeah. when it comes into play. Mirage Plus two Mesa. Of the, two of the tumbleweed thing where you can search up a basic and then make an XX pay the, the spree I, cost. What, what's your take on that card? I don't think it's very good. I mean, it's, it's fine for sealed, but. There's something so interesting about green's cards and we're sort of jumping all over the place, but like there's that one. And there's the 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 one in a green is plot for two in a green, make a creature an XX elemental where X is equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. Those are two cards in green that you don't want in your opening hand. Green has like a few of those where you're like, this is great if I top deck it on turn nine, but like I don't want to see this in my opener. And that's a tough sell for me to have cards like that. But I've been impressed. Like when you when when you cast it for six and it's a six mana, find a land, make a seven seven. Holy cow, is that great? Yeah, but you don't really need lands at that point. And that creature is so mopey. Like, yeah, I'm I'm just not here for the mopey creatures. That's that's my biggest takeaway from the format so far. So you've already sort of alluded to like removal, like the two for ones in the removal aspect. Where are you at on our, our hot take last week of is are we in a world where removal is not great? No, I, I've kind of come like full circle to a certain extent. I do think removal is great, but I think great removal is great or good removal is good. Like however you want to say it, removal that does nothing else for you, I don't think makes the cut here. Like because there are so many removal spells that give you a bonus in addition to whatever else they normally do or are hyper efficient. So, for example, Mystical Tether, the, the two and a white exile something. There's so many ways to blow up enchantments that the, like I'm kind of out on that mm. as a, a premium removal spell. Certainly playable, but not hugely desirable. Even though like explosive derailment in red, the, the two and a red deal for like, I don't think that quite gets there unless you're. Hmm needing to commit crimes and you want that to commit crimes and you're getting bonuses from the crimes. Like once you start being focused on crime synergy, then stuff like explosive derailment comes around because then it is deal four plus whatever crime bonuses you're getting. Right. But right. Just like putting an explosive derailment in my red green deck to kill your creature. I mean, you're going to, but it's felt pretty medium. Like, yeah. there's, there's so much removal that either gains you life or exiles gains you life or it's a spree card. And so you can do two things. Yeah. Yeah. Like, So I think removal that gives you bonuses and is efficient. Yes. A plus incredible and very desirable. Just killing something, even if it's at a pretty good rate. Like 
by limited heuristics, explosive derailment should be amazing. And I, mm-hmm. I think it's not even close to the top red common. Yeah, I think prickly pear and Wolverine are better than it personally. Yes. And 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 maybe jury's still out. Maybe the lackey, though, the one mana, one, two, first strike haste, sack to draw a card and make a treasure. Maybe that's even better than it. Who knows? I have a note for myself, and it sounds like you might disagree, to stop taking gold cards early. I was getting tripped up by this a little bit in early access on Wednesday. But I'm also wondering if this is because this was some this was something that this was when I had been in my ear when I was drafting MKM and prepping for the pro tour of like, I don't need to take private eye early and like try and spike blue white, like you just get deep into a color and then try and pair it. And I'm wondering if that's maybe a play booster world, like the, the world we're living in now with play boosters thing because of the double signposts per color that like finding that open lane, getting deep into a color and then figuring out what to pair it with is so much more valuable when you have the opportunity of like, I get deep into white and then a bunch of the white green signposts are opened and I get to move into white green and get those because no one else wants them. That's such a incredible spot to be in. I just found myself getting tripped up a little bit because I didn't feel, I think I was thinking there was a bit more bleed in the like blue, black, red, black department. And maybe there is, but I don't think there is like, there's not I, really I red was, black super streamlined. Red black is like outlaws. Yes. Do the outlaw thing. Yes. And so I like stuff like the um, intimidation campaign, which is incredibly powerful. I kept wanting to play with that. And then I was like, I could splash this. It's like, well, not really. Cause like, I mean, you, you can, but you have to just be focused on crimes and blue black is really good at focusing on crime. So like, just try and do that thing rather than like, I'll be black, white and have to splash the blue card and have to worry about crimes and also try and do whatever black white is doing. Like there just doesn't seem to be a lot of overlap. So I have found, I'm just going to try and note for myself to, to try and not take the gold cards super early. And or if I do to maybe not give them a ton of weight. Yeah. I, I mean, jury's still out from here. I just haven't played enough to know, but I assume, you know, once we do a week or two of drafts, we'll have a better answer for this. But I, I think it depends format to format how aggressively you want to take gold cards. One thing I have seen so far here is there are a lot of good ones that are splashable, though. Like make your own luck. Incredible and incredibly mm. splashable. Form a posse. Incredible and incredibly splashable. Form a posse. Incredible. It's really I think the games go long. And when you form a posse for X equals four. Yeah. Like, your opponent then all of a sudden has to block every creature you attack with. Right. It it's have you played against an army of mercenaries yet? Yeah, I've played against an army of mercenaries, but I I had an army of m- mythic rares, so it didn't matter. Oh, well. But I do think the games go long, and that's so why I think there's room more room potentially for splashing if the games are going longer. If if my vision about the the best decks in the format being late game formats correct, then I I, I could see taking gold gold cards a little more aggressively. Also, the gold cards are good and they are linchpins for their archetypes. So it might give you that might be that is a way to stay open. It just for whatever reason didn't work out in MKM. So we'll have to see if it feels similar here or not. Yeah, I'm just going gonna, gonna to keep keep it on notice for myself. Um, we didn't chat about it like we sort of did two weeks ago about like the texture of the boosters. I just think it's worth noting the like the big score cards do offer a lot of like some of them are just stone unplayable, like rest in peace or whatever, but there are a lot of bangers in that spot as well. So those are, it's a sheet of whatever 30 mythics that replace a common in one in five boosters, I believe. So like you're going to see what's that four or five of them per draft, basically they'll be opened at the table, I should say. So it's, they're going to come up. And then the, the OTP, the off the press, breaking news, whatever you want to call it, those are all, that's, that's the reprint slot. They're all cards that commit crime. So they add a lot of efficient removal into the mix. And the other thing is they add additional gold cards, which is another like point in the stay open category. Because like if you're blue-black, you're not only getting Lazav and uh, Intimidation Campaign, but you can also get Tyrant Score in the blue-black like you know, modal removal spell. And that's awesome. And so if you happen to be the only blue black drafter, you're just going to get those shipped to you. I've been of, of the cards. The one I wanted to shout out, throw back to our, one of our faves, Akoria back for more. is just awesome Four black green for an instant return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. When you do it fights up to one target creature, you don't control talk about just like you, you were saying there's so much blink and recursion for ETBs. Well, this yeah gets you the cards ETBs plus 
kills a thing as well. This card's incredible. All right, let's go on to some individual cards. Some, whatever, movers up, movers down. They're all sort of in the mix here. Just cards I wanted to talk about. One is, maybe I'm wrong about this still, Sheriff of Safe Passage, two and a white for a zero, zero. It enters the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it, plus an additional counter on it for each other creature you control. Has plot for one and a white. This might be like just a secret Boros card, but I think it's really impressive. I played against Voxy in early access, and she went one drop, plot this on two, prickly pair on three, cast this, and it's a four four. And I was like, oh, that's pretty, pretty ridiculous. Now, again, it's like, yeah, but maybe playing anything with prickly pair is going to be good. Like going one drop, two drop, two prickly, drop pair prickly pair is just going to be good. But it's, I think it's worth thinking about as just not you know, a straight, straight up F. Yeah. I'm, I'm very skeptical of that card <laughs> still, but I, that, that does sound like an impressive curve out for sure. Yeah. Uh, we, we already talked about Lone Shark. One exception to my plot rule is outlaw stitcher. What's going on there. This has got to be one of the best uncommons in the set. This is yeah. three and a blue for a one, four when it ETBs, you make a two, two blue and black zombie rogue creature token, then put two plus one plus one counters on that token for each spell you've cast this turn other than the first. And it's got plot for four and a blue. But again, you're rarely plotting this for five. Correct. So in that sense, like the five plot, you're kind of right. Like the plot four and plot five has moved down a bit. But you want to plot on two or plot on three and then cast this and get a one four plus a four four. But even the fail case of a one four and a two two for four mana is amazing. Yeah, I totally agree. Let's chat about Phantom Interference. So this is the spree card at common Blue, you can add three to make a 2-2 white spirit creature token with flying. You can add one to counter target spell unless its controller pays two. Yeah, I'm not crazy about this. I'm not going to call it yet, but I was very underwhelmed by this in early access. It was played around multiple times, either by my opponents just casting cheaper stuff or by them plotting instead of casting something the turn I was holding it up. And if you're trying to be proactive in any sense of the word, like being blue-red double spell, it's just pretty horrendous so i'm i'm gonna just cool it on this card until proven otherwise i think i agree i've I've watched it be pretty medium a lot and i played with not this but some other counter spells that were hard to use and even in sealed so i can mm -hmm. only imagine that gets tougher in draft i would think phantom interference is probably only good in the draw go control decks and if yes. that's the case you're not going to need to pick it that highly yeah it was like going super late in early access and i was like oh people don't know i think it turns out <laughs> i think it turns out i don't you know, don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> feels bad man yeah <laughs> uh next card on this list i want to talk about is desperate blood seeker one on a black two two lifelink when etb's target player mills two cards i think this card is excellent i think it's just like a bread and butter two drop and i think not just for the graveyard decks where like because so yes, in green, black, phenomenal, but like it commits crimes like two, two, two mana, two, two lifelink, I think is just good. Right. In and this then format tack so on committing a crime and tack on when on you it. top deck it, you get to commit a crime tack on. It has inherent synergies in black because there's like the one in a black get back a thing. There's the next card we're going to talk about. Like there's just ways to recur stuff in black itself. I think Desperate Bloodseeker is one of black's best commons, probably black's best common creature no there's a oh, three no, one the three draw one. card lose a life God, black is so nuts black is so crazy <laughs> all right it's time for the the huge mea culpa here for me lively dirge lively dirge one of the black sorcery with spree plus one search your library for a card put it into your graveyard then shuffle and plus two return up to two creature cards with total mana value four or less from your graveyard to the battlefield so while i was editing last week's episode i realized that there was a mode of this card that i just completely didn't think of which is if you have and we certainly will have those in the world of play boosters bombs that are three mana or four mana in your deck and this just becomes five mana search that up get it back like search it up put it into play and that is extremely powerful but also just you know i got to i played this in my deck with four raven of fell omens and like just get back two of those or go find one and get back that and one of the other ones like it's flexible enough I think ideally you want to do all of those things. Like you have a four drop bomb and you've got good twos to get back. And so this is uh, going to do all those things, but this card is good. Not super high pick though. Like just no. playable in the yeah. right deck. Yeah. Would you, you gave it like a C C plus. Yeah. yeah. Not enough. Right. Not enough. Not enough. 
Next up, we've got Rakish Crew. You're telling me this is not Bastion of Remembrance? I'm higher. I haven't seen this on the battlefield yet, but I'm higher on it after watching a bunch of gameplay. So this is the Tuna Black enchantment. It makes a mercenary, and whenever an outlaw you control dies, each opponent loses life, and you gain a life. The problem with this... So I kept taking this early, in, and by kept, maybe like twice. T- took this early in a draft. Got excited about seeing it, but realized that it... It's so narrow. And and Bastion of Remembrance in Aquaria was also narrow. Like you weren't playing that in black green big stuff. Like you were ideally playing that in black red sacrifice, maybe black white humans. And this has a similar restriction. Like this is incredible in black red. I think okay-ish in black white. But like white doesn't have a lot of outlaws. And you're just like, the you really need to be getting everything out of this card because Playing three mana for a 1-1 one, one is atrocious. It's atrocious in the format. So, like, this card is just, you just don't have the time for it, I think, a lot of the time. And it's not, like, you take it early and you're like, this is sick, it's going in any black deck. Not at all. You have a lot of draft and deck building requirements for this card, I think. Yeah, I would say black, red, gold card. Yeah, that's right. I, that's what I said. I said it might end up being a secret gold card. And that might just yeah. be right. And so... That's cool that it's seated like that, but it makes it drop in in stonks for me. All right, next up, we've got Raven of Fell Omens. Is this the collect them all for the format? I thought so. I liked it. This is the one in a black one, two flyer. Uh, whenever you commit a crime, uh, you drain your opponent for one and it triggers only once each turn. I had very good experience with this in early access, small sample size, etc. A few were open in pack one. They went around the table. I moved in. It felt very catch them all, build around at common. And if you can do that, I think it's going to be good. So there's two things you want to think about. One is taking any single color on color, like blue, black crime lands. So you're taking the, any black, white crime lands. Because what that lets you do is commit a crime on your turn when you hit your land drop, pass, remove something on their turn, and then you get a trigger on both your and your opponent's turn. So... Blue black, though, how does this slot into blue black? Does it turn it into like a tempo aggro deck then instead of control? Yeah, I think so. Is this right? its own? Is this its own archetype? It might be its own archetype because I think you could also maybe do it in black red. But I think that's the play pattern. You just want to like play the Ravens early, ideally, right? If you're if you're ending up with three or four, ideally, you're playing them early. And then you're just going like crime land on my turn, drain you attack in the air. I'm just Peck, 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 peck. Well, but that's, it's not peck, 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 peck. It's like, ouch. Like, because you're hitting for one in the air, the crime land hit for one, and you're draining for one. That's three. That's a very that's aggressive three, do drop. And then, and then pass and kill a thing on their turn and get another drain. Like, I think that's, I think that's a deck. I think that's a real deck in the format. That sounds good to me. I'm kind of in for it. <laughs> Raven of Fell Omens, let's go. Rictus Robber, duh, you were right. Three and a black, four, three. Plot two and a black. When ETBs, if a creature died this turn. You get a 2-2 blue and black zombie rogue creature token. Like, this card's great. Not, nothing nothing else to say. Speaking of great, this next card is not great. Oof. Shoot the Sheriff is rough. One in a black, instant, destroy target, non-outlaw creature. There are so many good outlaws. And then if you're playing against Grixis, you're just like, can I please find a target? Just anything so yeah. that I can get this out of my hand. This is... This is Again, what looks like an efficient removal spell, but in addition, this does nothing for you. Like, there's just way better removal than this. I, I think I'm totally off shoot the sheriff. Like, just you don't, don't like care about like it at all. Like, like might, sideboarded in against white green. Yeah, like might play it, but I, I do not think it is premium. Yeah, that's fair. I was I had a chat with a couple of local friends, and my friend was like talking about, uh, "Hey, is this card good?" I was like, "Yeah, it's fine." Like, I kept comparing it to cast down from OG Dominaria, which is the one of black, like destroy target, non-legendary creature. It's like, it's like fine. It's going to be worse than the common removal, but like, you don't, you're probably not cutting it. It's like a C. Yeah. It's going to be then, great against green. And then he was, it. he was sitting next to me in our home game pre-release, just like dead in his hand playing <laughs> against black, red outlaws. He just kept looking at me like, I don't know, Ethan. I was like, okay, I see it. I get it. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So that's, that's my feeling. Vault plunderer is incredible. Two in a black three, one, ETB's target player draws a card and loses a life. Like, still haven't still haven't targeted my opponent yet to commit a crime, but I imagine that's going to happen at some point to to finish him off maybe with a Raven. But uh, Vault Plunder has just been incredible. Yep, got some inspiring Overseer vibes for sure. I mean, it's not yeah. that level of good, but it is like you just 
grown when your opponent yeah. plays it because you know like you know you've gotten two for one already because that's a real body if you don't have mercenaries it's a threat like mm-hmm. you know, some boards it just can bully your opponent yeah <laughs> and then you you know against black it's coming back for more baby like it's so it's so unfun. Yeah. All right. That takes us on to our next card, which is at knife point. This is one of the black red uncommons. It's one black red for an enchantment. As long as it's your turn, outlaws you control have first strike. Whenever you commit a crime, create a one one red mercenary creature token that taps to pump something. This is an overperformer for me so far. You want repeatable ways to commit crimes to really rely on it. Slash, I think, again, all of the crime stuff. Because it's usually the crime payoffs are usually limit once per turn. So you really want to think about one of what are my repeatable ways to do it? And two, what are my ways to do it at instant speed? Like how can I consistently go commit a crime on my turn, commit a crime on my opponent's turn? That's where the crime lands come into play nicely. But if you can do that at like my friend was going off with that knife point and the the card we were kind of mid on the one and a red one three reach that you can pay oh, one yeah. tap to ping yeah. like. Yeah, that's a mover up too. That's not on this list. P- popping off with that. And I was like, okay, this seems kind of legit. Yeah, that card's good. Speaking of good, cool. Honest Rutstein. Yeah. One black green for a 3 2. When ETBs return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand, creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. Best and gravedigger ever? Truly. I mean, speaking of like best friends with Vault Plunderer, like turn five, Rutstein, get back Plunderer. Plunderer now costs two. Or I've had turns where I've gone Rutstein on five, play two two drops from my hand. Like, it's just a- explosive. And then Rutstein pairs so well with, again, that the one in a black get back a card and make a mercenary. Like, so that there's just all this recursion in black, and it, it's really hard to grind through. Graveyard stuff. They did Grave- it again. <laughs> Graveyard stuff that got us again. So we talked about Shoot the Sheriff. We're going to talk about the Deputy here. Two mana for a 1-2. Enters the battlefield. You can search your library for a basic land card or a desert card. Reveal it. Then shuffle. Put it on top. And it has the Mercenary tap at sorcery speed to give a creature you control plus 1 plus 0 oh until end of turn. Certainly an overperformer in Sealed, I think, because it gives you colorless fixing. But also, again, being able to fetch up deserts, I think, is big game because it fetches up Splash and it fetches up crimes i think this might i think this being a one two might still not be enough to knock it off the golden egg territory yeah i like silver deputy in theory i haven't seen it on the battlefield yet but i've been very impressed by the mercenary token so the fact that this has that text is i think good because i think the mercenary tokens have looked very impressive Mm -hmm. and the other thing that this can go get which is a card that's not on this list i don't think is the Karoo land that card has been oh. insane. No, it is. It's it's last. Oh, on it is. Land. It's last. Yeah, this card does so much. Uh, so it's arid archway. ETBs tapped. When it ETBs, you can return a land to your hand. If it was a desert, you surveil one, and it taps for two colorless mana. So if you have a, an arid archway, I mean, it depends on the point of the game, right? Because you don't necessarily want to be fetching that up early in the game, but potentially fetching you up two lands and arid archway picking up deserts to let you replay crimes while also letting you surveil and being a two for one intrinsically arid archway is nuts in so this i was drafting the other day my friend jared uh jmaz he typed in chat arid archway might be unpassable it's so good okay do you feel like you want to do anything to ensure are there just like not that many double pips in the format you have to be careful about that. Okay. But I mean, it's worth dealing with that for. for. It's very, very good. It's always funny when stuff like Karoo Lands, which were printed, what, like 15 years ago for the first time <laughs> more, are like still busted today. And you're just like, what? How powerful must this have been back then? <laughs> and we're still like, this is pretty good. Yeah. What's What's next on this list? Ariat's Lullaby up next. We always poo-poo this kind of card. One and a white for a sorcery. Destroy target tapped creature. You gain two life. I think this one's good. I think this is better than the the white mystical tether or whatever it's called. Really? Yeah, because I, I think white is bad. And I think white control <laughs> decks are pretty good. And this okay. goes in the white control decks. So I think this is good. This is a removal spell that's cheap. It's efficient. Gains you some life back. It's going to let you double spell. I, I like Ariat's Lullaby. Okay. Uh, Holy Cow is next. This is the two and a white 2-2 two, two flash flyer when ETBs. Uh, you gain two life and scry one. I also have really not seen this. I know you're, you're asking me about it. I haven't really seen it that much either. My gut says fine. Like that it's it's not. It's a two for one-ish. Like it gives you a lot. But then at the end of the day, it's just a 2-2 two, two flyer. It didn't actually draw you a card. 
Yeah, that's what it's not necessarily an overperformer. I just wanted to know how it how it felt because you were pretty hot on it. And I just yeah. literally have not seen it anywhere yet. I, I could really like all of my top three white commons. We're going to talk about another one here. I'm just sort of like kind of met on and I can't quite figure out why. And maybe you could put words to it. Why is take up the shield kind of feeling not great? This is the one in a white instant. Put a counter on target creature it gains lifelink and indestructible until end of turn. This card is on notice from me. And I, like, me I'm too. willing to I'm willing to say that I could be wrong about it, but it's on like significant notice from me, like getting ready to be benched for the rest of the season notice. I just think like creatures plus take up the shield is so small ball compared to the synergies that exist in the format and the cards that like do it on their own. Hmm. Like you have to get so lucky to like if you're playing to a point where you're you have a creature you want to protect and you're like playing to the point where you can play it plus hold up take up the shield that's way too slow like mm-hmm. so you're just having to like run things out and then your opponents have that window to kill them while you're tapped out to have run it out i i just don't think the format's aggressive enough to where take up the shield is as good as it normally is plus there's bounce plus there's exile running around like i just this i was horrifically underwhelmed by this card playing with it at the pre-release and in videos I watched I was just I was just not impressed. So okay, so if holy cow is meh, take up the shield is on notice. What about the the votes that vengeful townsfolk two and a white three three when a thing you control dies it grows? I also think that's kind of whatever. It's, it's super mopey. It's big dumb creature that does nothing else. I, so I'm, I'm is, pretty out on that card. <laughs> So what does white do? I think white's great in the blue white draw go deck. I think it has a home there. But what is do what does it do? Like what, what cards does white add to that? If you don't even like mist like cuz mystical tether at least can be a 5 mana removal spell with flash, but you don't like that. I guess it's tough. I mean, I I'm worried about the white archetypes. That's, that's what I'm I'm feeling that too right now. I'm like, well, I like black white, but I'm like, but that's just cuz black is not. But just black's great. Yeah. Or you like red white cuz there's really good red white gold cards and there's good red right. cards, but it's not yeah. really cuz you like white. And then green white mounts, I'm very worried about. I don't know. Okay. And and maybe when we get to drafting more and we figure out how to draft it, you'll be able to I think the trick to if take up shield is going to work. The trick is figuring out how to put enough pressure on the opponent that you can turn it into a good card. But it's it's tough to pressure people that much. There's so many efficient spells. So yeah. Mess with decks that are just like play a creature attack you. I just think that's a horrible plan in the format. Speaking of Mopey. who hard bristle bandit. Huge point for Ethan. This is one in a green for a one one <laughs> tap to add one man of any color. Whenever you commit a crime, untap hard bristle bandit. This ability triggers only once each turn. I every time this cast was cast against me in the pre-release, I was like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it just felt great. <laughs> this, this card is a mulligan. This card's terrible. It's, it's really bad. I'm yeah. I'm sorry, listeners. Don't pick card bristle bandit. That's OK. It's one of my whatever. Did you see? Did you see someone? It's one of our dear, sweet discord listeners went and checked the the scoring for the crash course for the last set. And they estimated a whopping 16 to seven in favor of Ben's evaluations, which Honestly, I don't know who to feel worse for me for not getting any cards right or you for doing a podcast with me. But <laughs> but Hard Bristle Bandit's one of my seven. We got, we got another point for you here in gold pan. I gold love this card. Pan. Two mana equipment. When ETBs make a treasure, equipped creature gets plus and plus one and has an equip cost of one. It, I mean, it's just good because of the treasure, right? And the plus one plus one. Yeah. I mean, like being able to move that around for one, but it 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 does enough. There's all the, all the pieces of the buffalo are here, as mm-hmm. we like to say. Next up, a nice flying white gravedigger, Shepherd of the Clouds, four and a white, four, three, flying vigilance. When an ETB is return target permanent card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to your hand, or it'll go to the battlefield instead if you control a mount. Yeah, I mean, giant flying white gravedigger. What's not to like? But yeah, I mean, but there have been a lot of cards of this ilk that have looked like five mana, six mana that have been clunky and not high picks. I think this one is good enough. And certainly, like, this is the type of card I'm talking about. Like, there's so many good two and three drop rares. Mm-hmm. Like, there's just so many ways to abuse them also with cards like Shepherd of the Clouds. And then maybe you're blinking Shepherd of the Clouds. There's just so much grind in the format. But yeah, this is like, I just want to splash this and in, in Abzan. Like, I feel like Abzan is more maybe where I'm I'm excited about the mounts and steed stuff and just like touching a little bit of white 
to get some of that the payoffs there. I haven't seen this card in play yet, but I'm excited to hear your thoughts on it. Emergent Haunting. One in a blue for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand, Emergent Haunting becomes a 3-3 spirit creature with flying in addition to its other types, and you can pay two in a blue to surveil one. I think this card is a beating on turn two. Yeah, wow. I was watching... Uh... LSV's video. If you haven't watched it, yeah, you should check it out. Listeners and Ethan. Is where this he the, had, uh, the one where he the did the mind break trap? Yeah. Against Kenji. Yeah. He was, well, he was playing against DeFore, actually. Oh, okay. And DeFore played this on two, passed or plotted on three. And I was like, oh, that's really good. Like, how's LSV going to get out of this? And then he had the, the double uh, archive trap. But yeah, yeah. I think Emergent Haunting is the real deal on turn two, either if assuming you're plotting on three or can hold up a counter spell or something. But if you can do this pass and still spend your mana on turn three while flipping this two mana, three, three flyer is real good. All right. Is it's real and spectacular rise of the varmints. I'm here for it. Yeah. I, I mean, three and a green sorcery make X two one green varmint creature tokens where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. You can plot it for two and a green. You can spend this early. Your opponent knows it's coming. What are they going to do about it? The, the games go long. The s- same thing with Form of Posse. It's good. It's splashable. And the games go long. I think, as, assuming you want them to. I think, you know, the lots of formats recently, we've seen Plan A being, you know, Tempo Aggro, that kind of thing. I, I think Plan A here is a little bit longer games, a little bit grindier games, and making sure you have a way to go over the top. And Rise of the Varmints is a great way to go over the top. And now is it like, okay, black green obviously is the best home for this because of the self mill. I'm also thinking about this with the plot caster mage, like do blue green or maybe your blue black. You got some self mill, you splash rise of the varmints like you've got to do some deck building requirement, drafting and deck building requirements, right for this? Yeah, I mean, you need to keep like a creature count of 14 to 15 creatures. And ideally you got some self mill in there. But I think I think it is less requirements than I would have initially thought for it to be playable. I mean, like you make three, two ones, you're pretty darn happy, right? Like Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to make eight for you to feel great about the card. Right. Next up, we have make your own luck. Three green blue for a sorcery. Look at the top three cards of your library. You may exile a non-land card from among them. If you do, it becomes plotted. Put the rest into your hand. You said this is Muldrifter levels of good. Yeah. It is. Okay. This card is just Mold Drifter. It's five mana. Look at the top three. You get one like to play. That's your Mold Drifter. That's the body. And the other two go in your hand. It's it's like play a thing a turn later. Draw two cards. This card is excellent. I think, again, this is a, a card. I, I agree. I've seen this cast once, and it the card my opponent plotted was the black green signpost, three black green to like get back a creature, put it into play, and then get back a permanent into your hand. And I was like, oh, that's insane. Like, they're just going to get to cast a five drop next turn for free, get back a thing, like, and they've drawn two. Like, just incredibly valuable. I do think, I saw someone else drafting this in early access, and they had two of these, and then, like, three or four other five drops. I do think you kind of, once you have Make Your Own Luck, maybe two of them, I do think you want to weight your curve a little higher there so you have the opportunity to get, like, big value off of the plot. I don't know that you need to, though, right? Like, wouldn't you spend five mana for a 2-2 plus draw two cards? Like, if it was just like your two drop, like your green 2-2 vigilance, pay one. Like, I don't think you care what you hit as long as you're hitting something. I think this card is just great with no work at all. All right, just Muldrifter. Well, that that's going to round out the cards that we wanted to check in on. Let's do a pack one, pick one from the early access event. So pack one, pick one. You sit down and see the following cards as options. Two deserts. I think it's going to be like how long before we're first picking crime lands? Probably, probably tough with the amount of busted rares that you'll be opening. But you there's can, a lot you... of good uncommons and commons too. Yeah, but the okay. crime lands are going to be really high picks for the blue black and black red decks that want to commit crimes. So, so probably not picking a desert here. Commons in consideration between patient naturalist two and a green two three etbs mill three and then put a land from among the milled cards into your hand if you can't create a treasure token my opponent last night whiffed on this and then made a treasure and they're like i think i might prefer that like <laughs> what i think but like they were just like i think i just want to ramp like next turn rather than like maybe they already had lands in their hand didn't matter and i was like it's interesting that like it's may not be a downside to whiff on this yeah now, uh, the other one is Irascible Wolverine, two and a red, three, two. When ETB is exiled, the top card of your library. Until end of turn, you may play that card as plot. If 
for two in a red. Also, well, this should probably be on our movers up. I mean, I liked this, but this card is just excellent. Fake your own death. One in a black instant. Just another of black's excellent cards. Till end of turn, target creature gets plus two plus zero oh and gains. When this creature dies, return to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control and you make a treasure token. Like, talk about abusing the ETBs in the format. Play this on a vault plunderer. Get a treasure. Draw your card again. It's just incredible. I'm not crazy about any of these uncommons. Are you, where are you at on binding negotiation? The one on a black sorcery. Target opponent reveals their hand. You may choose a non-land card from it. If you do, they discard it. Otherwise, you may put a face-up exiled card they own into their graveyard. Like the dream is they plot something and then you steal that and they invested mana in it. Is that that good? I don't. It's like just a removal so. spell. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't love it. It's yeah. probably playable. And then hashtag play boosters. We have three rares to talk about. <laughs> One is fortune, loyal steed, two and a white, two, four beast mount. When the ETBs scry to, when it attacks while saddled at end of combat, exile it and up to one creature that saddled it this turn, then return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. And as saddle one, we also have claim jumper, two and a white, three, three vigilance. When the ETBs, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for a planes card and put it onto the battlefield tapped. Then if an opponent controls more lands than you, repeat this process once. If you search your library this way, shuffle. And Archmage's Charm from the uh, the Prosperity Post. Triple blue for an instant. Choose one. Counter target spell. Target player draws two cards or gain control of target non-land permanent with mana value one or less. Don't think we're taking Archmage's Charm. I think it's probably between the two white rares. Unless I could see... I could see the red and green commons being in the mix too, honestly. That's what I was going to say. Like, is there a world where you feel like you're getting baited into drafting white by taking these two cards? Like, Fortune yeah, well, is not that good. Certainly, like, a- after playing, like, this was still, like, in early days, like, having played with the set a little bit now and being a little wary of white, I think I agree. Fortune is not that good. Like, so it's a three mana, two, four. If you saddle it, it has to have attacks, and then you have to have saddled it with something with an ETB. It's like a it's like a two and a white, two, four ETB scry two. I mean, like you get the the three mana three two surveil two at colorless. Like <laughs> I, I right. don't know that I don't know that fortune is that. I, I think I would be leading on patient naturalist here, like no yeah. kappa. Or if or Raskable Wolverine and Red ends up being, you know, second best color and maybe red black. I do think red black is kind of nuts. I think but red I black Wolverine's is nuts. I, I don't think Wolverine is necessarily premium in that deck. The problem is just like there's just so many two for ones at three mana. It's like take your pick, but that doesn't make this worse. Like it just means that you might get filled up on them. But I agree. I like and also claim jumper. I don't think is that good. Like three mana, three, three vigilance. If you're on the draw, you tutor up a planes like, OK, it's fine. It's fine. I, I, I think I would take patient naturalist here. Yeah, with, I think, with the knowledge I have currently. I think that's a good take. I think that's a good take. I didn't at the time. I took Fortune and then ended up moving it to the sideboard because didn't want to play white and didn't want to play that. I just clicked ahead here. You're real happy if you take <laughs> if you take Patient Naturalist because pack one, pick two. Stubborn Burrow Fiend, and you're off to the varmints rising up, baby. Stubborn Burrow Fiend is the, the one in a green 2-2 two, two, when it becomes saddled for the first time each turn. Mill two. Uh, and then you get plus X plus X where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. It's got saddle two. The card's insane. It's like a two mana five five. It's really good. The card is not remotely reasonable. Yeah, but both of those end up in the sideboard because then I get intimidation campaign pick three. And I was like, I'm doing this. I haven't done this yet. I'm going to do it. I, I don't think it's that good. Is that blasphemy? Well, that's Am wrong. I wrong. You're wrong. I've played with it. Games go long, he said, and you don't want Intimidation Campaign? Get out of here. It's a little clunky. It's a little clunky. I, I We were having such a good time. Why are you ruining this episode <laughs> right at the end? I mean, I like it. I had fun no, you casting don't. it. No, you don't. You just said it was clunky. A little clunky. <laughs> just coach. I mean, there's a there's a lot of ways to draw cards that don't involve spending three mana to do nothing. This is horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> Terrible thought, way to end the podcast. I thought we were friends, but we're not. All right. On that note, I'll be pegged as the person who hates uh, Intimidation Campaign for the rest of time. I, I Listen, I don't know. Jury's out for me. I haven't played enough yet.
Can, yeah. we, can we just can we just check back in next week? That sounds good. All right. Thank you, as always, to Salty Pretzels for our intro and outro music. Make sure you give it a listen. You can find all of our content at our website, lordsoflimited.com. Ben, can the people expect a tier list? Oof. <laughs> yes, that's the right answer to that question, right? It has been a week and a day. I'm getting ready to go to a concert right after this. Wow. Uh, I will. I got to mow my yard. Oh, bit hashtag this... homeowner stuff. Well, look, at the very least, you can check our Murders of Karlov Manor tier list before diving into <laughs> OTJ on Tuesday. Uh, it'll, it'll be up. It'll be up before Tuesday. Cross my heart. That's promise. it. That's our uh, that's on our website. We've got our merch courtesy of T Public. We've got our Patreon page. We've got our episode backlog links to our YouTube and Twitch channels all at lordsoflimited.com. If you've got any feedback about the show or any questions, or you want to tell me to get my act together and get the tier list ready to go, shoot us an email at lordsoflimited at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll catch you next week for another episode of Lords of Limited. Thanks, everybody. See you later.